We live in a time where masculinity is shamed and men don't know what it means to be a man. As a pastor and counselor, I've spent the better part of my life equipping and training others. My goal with this show is to translate my hard-earned experience into tools and tactics to help you become stronger as a man. This is the Brave Co. Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Bellet. Margaret, thank you so much for coming on with me. Um, man, it's such a treat. Anytime that I get to sit down and have a conversation with you, pick your brain is such a privilege, but also you are the first woman that we've had on the Brave Co. podcast. What? Yeah, feel, that's a big deal. I feel really honored right now. Yeah. Well, I think the honor is all ours. And there's a reason why you're on here. Um, one, you are one of my most trusted friends and partners to work with. I have a lot of people that uh, over the years have come and said, man, who's the best person that I can get help from um, counseling or or Sozo or uh, my marriage is struggling and you're it. So when I tell people, if you want the best of the best, uh, mm -hmm. Margaret, Dr. Margaret Nagib, who's a clinical psychologist, she's the best. So um, over the years, we have worked closely together. Uh, we've done some pretty fun uh, work uh, together with some clients and then um, just had a really good time uh, jumping on Instagram every once in a while and teaching some uh, at some conferences and doing things like that. So mm -hmm. uh, thanks so much for coming on here, Margaret. Uh, I'm excited for our talk today. Oh, I'm so excited. We always have fun. It's true. Well, we're going to kind of dive in. Um, one of my, the questions that I get asked so much about uh, in my everyday life and that I've worked through a ton and you're an expert on is really how to work through anxiety and depression. And, um, you know, I think I'm kind of tired of talking about COVID. I've talked about it so much, mm -hmm. uh, but it is still relevant uh, as far as where people are at and what's happened in our country and throughout the world. Um, but I really noticed an uptick a lot in people's inability to regulate their emotions, their inability to, uh, you know, go throughout their day and feel peace, feel free of uh, fear, feel free of depression, feel free of anxiety. And I just, there's so many people right now who, it, for the, I think for, for me, it's, there's so many people, professionals in the professional world and just people in general that are struggling severely with, with either depression, bad depression, or really bad anxiety. And even more so than I remember growing up, which probably I'm getting older, so I'm seeing more of it. Um, but I really, what I love about you is your ability to really break things down and give practical application. And so I want to do that. I wanted to just dive into this topic and first kind of talk about um, what is anxiety, what is depression, and um, why are we seeing so much of it today? Why does, it, why does it feel like three quarters of the people I know are either struggling or have struggled with it severely? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anxiety and depression are, are two forms of when we are beyond our capacity to cope. So I okay. think part of yeah. the reason why we're seeing so much of it right now is because honestly, we've all been pushed beyond, you know, not just to our limits, but beyond our limits. Yeah. Um, and we're also in an unprecedented time where I'm not just dealing with my world, but because of social media, the news and how quickly we get information, I'm also dealing with the world that I can't have any control over to much degree, you know, yeah. like Ukraine, for example, you know, there's only so much I can do. And so it weighs on us to hear not, you know, to deal with not just what's, you know, stress in your own life, but then the fact wow. that we're also hearing all the political, social from all around the world. And so 
when someone's anxious or depressed, you've, you've got a system, right? Their body, their soul, their spirit. You've got a system that is beyond, is feeling like it can't cope. It's, it's beyond what you can cope with. Yeah. It, I've heard a lot recently, um, my wife and I were talking yesterday about anxiety in general. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I was watching this documentary the other day about the brain and how we were never meant to even Mm -hmm. process Mm -hmm. this much information at once. And it's so true. Um, when COVID started and I know we're two years, uh, from the start of it, Mm -hmm. uh, from the recording of this podcast, um, when COVID first started, I, I had just had a baby and my daughter Edie. And, uh, I remember golly got home from the hospital literally that week and then seeing people wearing masks and hearing all the stuff and mm-hmm. it coming out. And I watched the news for about a month, you know, I was trying to figure out what everyone else was trying to figure out what the heck's going to happen in my life. Mm-hmm. Are we going to be okay? Are we not going to be okay? Yeah. And I remember, um, in about March, uh, let's see, March, April, May. So maybe two, three months in about May, I decided I am done. Mm -hmm. I can like, I can't handle the amount of like, I actually can't regulate all the information that's coming in Mm -hmm. and still every day be okay. I can't do all this stuff. And the funny thing is, is I literally, I haven't watched the news since then. It's just been off. Yeah. But I think you're right. I I know you're right. The amount of day-to-day information that we get, Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of flooding is is playing such a heavy toll on people, let alone uh, whatever happened in their childhood. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever they're carrying. uh, Yeah whether they had a traumatic childhood or a good childhood, right. Um, that just weighing on them. Um, when we get into this subject a a little bit deeper, how does, like, how do our emotions actually work? I, I think getting into that a little bit and diving into our emotions, we were really helpful for people to understand. Cause I actually don't think people really understand emotion and, Mm -hmm. and how, you know, the the cycles and how it really works. Can you explain that some? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just have to say, I love your story, first of all, because the same thing happened with me Uh, early on, like in March. I already had clients, of course, you know, wanting to talk about it. And so I went to God and was like, God, okay, I I don't know what's happening, but my clients are going to come to me. So what should I do? And I specifically heard God say, quarantine your thoughts and tell your clients to do the same thing. And what I love about what happened with you is God knows you better than you know you. And he knows what you, Jason Valentin, needed. Some other kid might not have needed that. Yeah. So the first step with our emotions and handling what's coming at us is not being afraid to say, you know what? I I need, I think I need this. At first, that was hard for me because I felt like, oh, I'm being, am I being apathetic? Am I being, and, and like you to this day, I have not. It's a little embarrassing sometimes because <laughs> I'm like, oh, I didn't know, you know. Um, but I figure it, when I need to know, I'll know. But God knew what I needed. And in the end, I feel like I've been better able to be present to my clients. So the first step with emotions, part of why we want to get self aware is one of the, questions you're going to ask yourself is what do I personally need? And that might look like, Mm -hmm. might look different than your wife or whoever, what they need. So we all have, they call it in psychology, a window of tolerance. And that's the window in which you can, you can do pretty good. It's kind of like when you're lifting weights, there's a window of where you can push yourself. And, and if you're smart, you'll learn not to push yourself beyond that window or what's going to happen. You're going to be injured yep. but in the same way. Each one of us has our own personal kind of window of tolerance for certain emotions. And if we, when we go too far outside of that window, we can get anxious or depressed. So that's really important to know, but from day to day, we just, 
all of this is forcing us to get better and better at processing our emotions as yeah. we go. Like we don't have the luxury anymore, honestly, of letting things build up. There's there's too much coming at us too quickly. And so I think what this has highlighted for people who who are finding themselves more struggling more than normal is, oh man, I have to up my game. I have to up my game with really tending to this part of my being, which is the soul, the psyche. Yeah, it's interesting because um I feel like, like me, I feel like a lot of people just get caught off guard. Mm -hmm. And I hear that a lot. Like, I was fine. I had a friend call me uh, last year, maybe two years ago, whatever. And he was like, I don't know what's going on with me. That's his opening Mm -hmm. conversation. I don't know what's Mm -hmm. going on with me. Mm -hmm. I was fine. I went to the dentist Mm -hmm. and I was getting some work done at the dentist. And then I ended up in this panic attack. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any idea that. Like he was maxed. Yeah. He didn't have any idea that I am, I am beyond my limits uh, emotionally. And so I think, you know, you brought up this word Mm self-awareness. I think that a lot of people have never even really thought of the concept of Mm -hmm. self-awareness, especially as it relates to emotions. Yeah. Um, and, and when we talk about men too, I mean, let's be honest, Brave Co is mostly men listening to it. Mm-hmm. And we were taught as men, right? Like emotions are weak. Mm-hmm. If you're a man, you need to suck it up. You need to push forward. Uh, yeah. If you want to be a great leader, you got to be rock solid. Mm-hmm. And so just shut off those emotions. But I'm yeah. finding that like, listen, freaking he man, uh, the rock. <laughs> there's some chink in your armor. And, and when you, when you go for a long period of time without really paying attention to where you're at and you don't have a solution for all the stresses and the pressures that are coming, like you're going to crack. And, and people are, are cracking. Um, What's when it comes to, like regulating your emotions. Mm -hmm. So my friend, for instance, who starts to feel anxiety coming on, he starts to feel panicky. Like what's the plan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to to process that? Cause it's easy to say like, okay, you need to process your emotions, but I don't think most people know how. Yeah. Well, I mean, kudos to him for being honest with you. Like the first thing out of his mouth sums up. So obviously he was self-aware enough to know, that, you know, he was off. And I would just say, like, just know when you're off your game. That's all that means. I'm off my game. And it's usually I'm off my game because something, something inside me is overwhelmed or off or something. So then if you can stop and just ask yourself, okay, I feel a little off. Yeah. What what's going on? Um and there's three places to check in with, right? You check in with your body. Man, I've been more tired lately. Or this is the one I hear from men. Uh, Honestly, this is the big one I hear from men. Man, I am just blowing up at my wife. My my fuse is really short. I don't want to be like that. I feel horrible. But like, I just, I'm agitated, you know? So that's a big one. I think I see. So if you notice that. Um, So that's your body. Right. And then your emotions, you know, am I kind of down? Am I depressed? Am I having weird thoughts? Um, Like, what's the point? This is too hard. And then you start to just um, try to label it as best as you can. And then try to sort out, you know, what might be contributing to all of these things. But honestly, it starts with accepting it. You can't push it away. You can't. The more you fight, the thing about anxiety, you know, the more you fight anxiety, the worse it gets. Mm. Can you explain that? Well, this is what people, this is what we do. It's kind of the natural intuitive response is on some level, we recognize the thought, right? And we're like, well, I can't think like that. I got to stop thinking like that. Yeah. Well, then I'm fighting my own thought. 
But the more you say, I can't think like that, the more you you think like that. Yeah. So now you're completely caught up in anxiety and you're trying to solve the problems of anxiety. So anxiety is like, I was thinking about this the other day, I was talking to a client and I was like, oh my God, anxiety is like uh, virtual reality goggles. Okay, you're playing a game, you got that virtual reality on and I know what that's like, it's wild. Like it's just, it's wild. And so you're in anxiety's game and you're fighting the thoughts. But what you don't realize is that's making it worse. What you got to do is you've got to recognize, oh, no, I've got this. I got to take the glasses off. Right. This is a losing game here. I'm not going to win this game. And all the problems coming at me that I'm supposed to solve in this game are unsolvable. And it causes you to question yourself. So one minute you're like, well, I shouldn't think that. Maybe I should think that like the very mind that just told you this is now telling you this, right. And you're having this battle in your own brain. So if you can stop and go, Whoa, that's not the problem. The problem is right now I'm in anxiety and I actually need to relabel that. This is not problems with my finances. This is not problems with my spouse. This is not problems in my body or whatever. This is anxiety. I'm going to, Relabel and refocus off the anxiety. And then then I'm going to look at my life through clear eyes instead of kind of in this virtual reality. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So when people get caught up in that, like they're engulfed in the anxiety. So um, which for me a lot, anxiety would go, well, what if? Like there's so mm-hmm. many what ifs inside of anxiety yeah. that I would get stuck in these these what if loops for freaking ever. It's like a getting caught in a tornado right. where right. I I started off with like, oh man, uh, I don't know that I have enough money. And then it's like, well, what if I never have enough money? And what if right. I don't get out of this? And how long am I going to be in this? And right. pretty soon yeah. I'm like, well, I'm going to go bankrupt and Right. And right. it goes even worse than that, right? It starts attacking yeah, my identity is. and all that stuff. And so yeah. what you're saying is like, first stop and realize, listen, this spiral is actually anxiety. Yep. Like I'm not solving this problem. Nope. This is not a, this, this right here isn't something that I'm going to solve with the tool called anxiety. So instead of right. like, instead of try to fight that off, you're going, just label it for what it is. Yep. Label it for what it is. And then that's where distraction is really actually healthy. Okay. Because I'm no longer going to entertain your problems, anxiety. I'm not your counselor. Yeah. I'm working way too hard for you. Yeah. I'm going to distract from that. Why? Because I'm going to give my physiology a chance to come down off of that high that anxiety gives us. Yeah. And the adrenaline and the cortisol and all that stuff. And I'm going to refocus my mind. I'm going to give that, I'm going to give that dog a different bone. Yeah. Um, when it comes to refocusing, uh, the reason why I, li- I like talking about this so much is um, this relabel. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Relabel, refocus mm-hmm. exercise. Mm-hmm basically saved my life. Yes. Yes. I mean, fully. So yeah. when guys are listening to this or girls, uh, mm-hmm. this is a tool that revolutionized my life. And I, I've tried so many different things, but it really works like the ability to. So for me, the ability to go, oh, this crazy thought process mm-hmm. that I get in this whirlwind, mm-hmm. that's anxiety. And then once I could accept that it was just anxiety, That's all. the, yeah. And then what else helps with that is that knowing, okay, this emotion that I'm having right now doesn't last forever. No. Like just plain anxiety. It's got a lifespan, right? Yeah. Like I can't remember how short the lifespan is, but it's, it's yeah. just going to go up and it's going to come back down. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So you're talking about and, emotion cycle. Yeah. Where it goes zero, 
I label it zero to 10 just for the sake of explanation, right? Let's say it goes zero and sometimes it may go to five and come back down. And then you have those days where it full on goes to a 10. And that's when you're thinking those crazy thoughts and you feel like you're you, just shoot me now. Right. And you're also thinking, I, will I, will I ever feel normal again? That is a really common feeling at this point too. But you know, if you can recognize that emotions have a natural rise and fall in intensity and you can ride it out, then you're actually, you're actually improving your window of tolerance. We call that distress tolerance. And I'm actually getting stronger, right? The same way you would be getting stronger as you do more resistance and you deal with more resistance and weights. You're getting stronger in your ability to tolerate the discomfort of those emotions, knowing that you're going to get to the other side. And then you no longer have to be afraid of your own emotions. So let's face it, men, we've been taught, you've been taught to be afraid of your emotions. It's this true. Is why They're so afraid, scary. Which is this, the most ridiculous thing that the strongest people in many ways are the ones who have been taught, hello, the enemy, that they should be afraid of their emotions. So you know you what's even start? scarier? Yeah. You know what's even scarier than a man's emotions? A woman's emotions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because we're all over the place. We are, I mean, we are all over the place. I only know that because we try everything in the book <laughs> to not have to face those. That's right. That's right. That's level two. Start with, let's start with you. But yeah, and part of that is because it evokes your own. It evokes your own and it evokes that feeling of powerlessness. You know, the most powerless thing for a man, I think, is wanting to help someone and not knowing how to help them. Someone's coming to you for help, someone you care deeply about, you know, your spouse, your daughter, your, and you want to help them and you don't know how to help them. Why? Because you're getting swept up in their emotion. They're at a 10. There's this very real thing called mirroring in psychology. I actually posted a meme about that. And it was this meme of she was she was messing with her husband is what she was doing. But they were walking out of their house and then she pretended like something bad was happening. And then all of a sudden he started mimicking her and he was like, what's going on? What's going on? So we mirror. It's the same thing with little kids. You know, one little kid starts to cry and then all of a sudden the other little kid starts to cry. You In that moment, you are mirroring, let's say, your wife's emotions instead of recognizing like, oh, I'm actually good and I actually can help her. I can just be stable. That's all she wants. I can be stable while she's having a moment. And if I'm feeling something, it's just because I'm empathizing and mirroring her. That's all. Well, listen, guys, we might dive into that in a second. <laughs> <laughs> we just went from like ninja level to like god yeah. level info yeah. good point. um and it no it's good because that it's so true when when we don't know what to do in life i mean we want we want to avoid and, mm -hmm. and that's you know we're back to adam and eve right we're back to passivity yeah. uh mm -hmm. or adam i should say we're back to blaming mm -hmm. uh because we we don't know what to do yeah. we uh we want to avoid that we just want to make her happy and yeah. And which isn't really true. I want to make me happy and, well, and if avoid you've had problems. Any, and, I, and I just need to say this because avoidance isn't all passivity. If you've had any kind of trauma around emotions in your childhood, like let's say it was a chaotic childhood or, or, or let's say you had a female in your life kind of inappropriately have bad emotional boundaries with you. Avoidance is a symptom of trauma. Mm. So not all avoidance is just some guy being passive. Sometimes there's some something there that's being triggered for you. Yeah, it's so true, and it it could it could really be true that your your survival instincts kicking in. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. So getting just getting back on track because I really want to give these guys this gift right of this tool. Yeah. Um. So you were explaining beautifully how our emotions they have a life cycle. They're going to go up for a little while. Yeah. And yeah. it, depending upon the thought or how triggered you get, whatever, how much trauma you have, what, whatever, whatever, how strong that trigger is. Yeah. It's going to go up 
and I may hit a five. And mm -hmm. if I just recognize, oh yeah, that's what's happening. I realize it. It's going to come back down. Not a big mm -hmm. deal, man. Yeah. I can talk myself off of this crazy ledge yeah. so fast and then it never really builds, right? It, it just actually runs its course and it dies out. I think you said 20 minutes last time is, is like the life cycle of a- Well, so get this, emotion. there's new research that says, which blows my mind and I'm not, I, I'll be honest, I am not there. There's new research says that the actual life, with the lifespan of an emotion is 90 seconds. But that's if you Nine. truly, yeah, but that's if you truly process it. 90 seconds? My number is much more forgiving. My my number is like 20 yeah. minutes. But but yeah, so zero, yeah. zero, the maximum is 10. And the reason why I give you a maximum is because sometimes we feel like we're just going to keep, but you won't. Like there is a maximum. And you know what? I, God bless you. I hope you hit it so that you can have the experience of I hit that maximum. You know, I had this experience one day by myself at home. I'm in my bed. I'm like, I'm having an emotion. And it got so scary that a part of me actually said to myself, I was able to kind of have some self-awareness in the moment. And I was like, I hope my, I hope my neighbors can't hear me because they would probably really be worried about me right now. Cause I'm like, I'm letting it, I mean, I had no choice, but to let it up. And then I went to bed, finally went to bed. And then the next morning I was like, well, I feel fine. How crazy that last night I was here and today I'm here. So my challenge to the guys is like in a safe and healthy way, let yourself go there. You're going to be okay. No one ever died from an emotion. Why? So that you can learn that you really do get to the other side and that you are in control of your emotions. So the thing is, well, what do you do? You try to label the emotion in the moment if you can. And then what I do that helps me a lot is I'll, I'll, I'll give it a number zero to 10, right? Why? So I can go, Oof, yeah, it's a 10. It's a 10, but you know what? It's probably in real life. It's probably a three, but right now it feels like a 10, especially if you think that you tend yeah. to, you know, later tend to overblow things like I do. <laughs> so you tell yourself that it's a 10. And that also helps me too. It's like, well, I've hit my max. So that means I'm on the way up down the other side. Now, is that going to be uncomfortable? Heck yeah. Because now you're going nine, eight, seven. You don't go 10 to zero. I'm sorry. It does not how it works. You've got to go one, two, three, four, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. So what do you want to do in the meantime? You don't want to make decisions. Do not make a decision when you're there. And then what are some healthy things? You're going to have a list of healthy things you can do to get yourself through that really intense time. Now, we can do healthy things. We could do other things that maybe later we will regret. But you know what? Those things that we regret later, they work. Porn works. You know, Whatever, alcohol works. It really yeah. does work. I'm not going to sit here and argue with you that it doesn't make you feel better. It yeah. does. But then you're stuck right where you started off with, which is you, then you need it to, you need it to get through emotion and you never really complete that cycle. It just, it kind of sits there. And it's like, it's like the bank account, the negative bank account builds. Yeah, yeah it's so true. So that, that refocus is so important and having a pre-made plan on which we can talk about in a second is key because especially if I know myself like, Oh, recently I've been struggling with X thing mm -hmm. and it's just getting me all over the place. Okay. I can have a plan for that. Like when this anxiety comes, I just feel it. I, I relabel it and then now I'm going to refocus. So one of the, one of the, you, you told me when I was working through all this stuff, you were like, you can read a book backwards. You can play with your baby. Mm -hmm. You can do anything besides try to fight it and solve it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what worked the best for me Tell me. and guys, this is like tried and true. So <laughs> I love this topic because I mean, I feel like a pro at this right here, uh, is I would move, and this is going to sound so churchy, but it worked. I move straight into ridiculous thankfulness. 
like like crazy level thankfulness. So what would happen is uh, I would typically I'd be like in bed sleeping. I'd wake up. I'd wake up at like a six man mm-hmm. with with like anxiety and then it would keep climbing, and climbing, and climbing. Mm-hmm. And then I'd be like, I would <laughs> first your brain goes, what if what if Margaret's lying and this doesn't work? What if this key, you know, and then I would go straight into, I'm so thankful for hunting. I'm so thankful for uh, the conversations that I have with my wife today. I'm thankful for my kids. And then pr- the more I dive into this thankfulness, it's like 3 a.m. I'm just doing like, blah. before you know it, like I am all the way down at a one. And then the coolest thing happens you have so much confidence because what you felt so enslaved to before I realized, Oh, that just worked. Yeah. Dang. That was cool. So every time you get a little tiny victory in this, you build up this confidence, right? Which is, is so cool because confidence is only built through doing. And so here's the full disclosure for me when I was working through this with you, Margaret, if you remember, I was, Mm -hmm. I had had my baby, so baby number four, it was COVID and I was cutting, I had cut off of colonzapam. So I'd been on it for eight wow. years. Wow. Which for I had to know is like a hardcore way to just shut down your body from feeling anxiety. But then when you try to go off of it, it's hard. It's so hard, hard to stay. So I got all the way down to zero, you know, I hadn't been taking it for a while mm-hmm. and then holy smokes. Mm-hmm. I was, I had to relearn. I had to completely relearn how to regulate my emotions again. Yeah. 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 And that was when I called you, I was desperate. I was, yeah. I was crying. I was like, I don't know if I'm ever not going to feel this way. I remember asking you one day, mm-hmm. am I ever not, am I ever going to not feel this? And you said, well, you're trying to be so nice. And you're, your psychologist <laughs> way. You were like, well, you'll always feel anxiety, but it won't do the same thing. And I was just like, Oh no. But the coolest thing happened in, um, I, rem- I specifically remember our conversation. I remember where I was sitting, you taught me this stuff. I wrote it down. And then I remember going to work. Like I treated it like it was a job. Like I'm going to do this. I'm going to, because what I kept doing is I kept trying to solve the anxiety. Mm-hmm. I kept trying to, to analyze it and to figure it out and to then I'd rationalize like why it's not true and why it's not real and apply the biblical truth to it. Yeah. And, and it was like, oh my God, I'm so That's freaking right. tired. Yeah. So the more I tried to fight it, the deeper uh, one, the more I got into the anxiety, but the, the less emotional energy I had. That's right. That's right. And so when I just relabeled it, you actually said to me, you said, Jay, Sometimes with people who have OCD, and you actually said, I'm not saying you have OCD, but sometimes when people have OCD, they say this phrase that really helps them. When they start feeling anxiety, they say, it's not me, it's OCD. Or when they start obsessing, or it's not me, it's OCD. And that phrase, like, oh, this thing isn't me, like completely, why I'm highlighting this so much is because this is the piece that once it made sense for me, like completely detaching myself from yes. this is me. This is something that I have to solve. This is something mm-hmm. I've got to, mm-hmm. like, I got to battle this thing and going like, oh, that's not me. I almost treated it like it was some random thing that just showed yeah. up. And I'm like, yeah, really? mm-hmm. what, mm-hmm. what are you doing here? You yeah. can just, you can stay over there, like stay as long as you want. I'm just going to be over here working on my thing. There you go. I'm going to go back to work with my thankfulness or my house or my kids. Mm -hmm. And that almost completely wiped out. Listen, guys, this lifetime, I realized when I look back, why I got into masturbation at such a young age is I didn't know how to regulate this anxiety from a young age. That was actually my, my finding masturbation at, I think nine or 10 years old. 
mm-hmm. I never knew why, why did I get so mm-hmm. attached to it? Well, then I remembered back, I was always had this irrational fear of death and things happening mm-hmm. and you know, all this bad stuff. That's mm-hmm. how I dealt with it. Wow. And that's right. Once I, the age when kids recognize like, Oh, people die. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so this was massive. Um, so let's go through a, a hypothetical, can we? Because I, I like hypotheticals. I, th- I think that it helps people. Um, sure. The guy that's going throughout his day and gets triggered. His trigger could be he does a bad job at work, uh, mm-hmm. has a hard conversation with his boss, or yeah. um, feels disconnected from his wife and has a coworker that he's tempted to connect to uh, anything like that, where you start to, you start to get this anxiety, mm-hmm. you start to get a panic attack, same thing, you know, um, mm-hmm. you get, you get into a bunch of traffic and you start feeling stuck. Mm-hmm. Okay. Can you take us all the way through just real quick? The here's, here's some good steps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I need everyone to actually, before they end up in a situation, like today, start writing down, what are the things that trigger my anxiety? Because the moment you're at, you're in your car feeling stuck is not, it, you have to do it when your brain is actually, we're talking to Jay yeah. and not his anxious brain. Yeah, right? So, so you're good. in a good moment. You're going to, you're going to write down a list of what are the things, especially if you've been struggling with it a lot. Um, when are the times, you know, so for you, the morning, right. And what do I norm? How do I normally think? And what do I do? Hmm. Okay. And then you're going to draw a big circle around that. And you're going to say, Oh, that's kind of like we did with your OCD. Oh, that's anxiety. You know? So I'm no longer, I'm going to tell myself my goal is to to lessen the, the, the amount of time I spend trying to solve the problems that anxiety creates that aren't real problems. Yeah. Right? That's what you were doing initially. You were fighting the thoughts that anxiety was sending at you. That is a losing game. And it might work for a little while, but then it's like a video game where they, they start coming at you faster and then you can't. But if I can go, oh, this is not even me. That's not Jason. That's anxiety talking. And then what am I going to do to um, make it through when I do feel it so I can get to the other side? So for you, you know, radical gratefulness works for you. And um, that's, that's brilliance. That actually covers body, soul, and spirit. Because basically what you were doing was you were like, you were, you were, making your reality a hope reality. And we know so I, there's so much research on hope that hope changes everything for people. So by being grateful for what you already knew existed, you were giving yourself hope for the present and for the future. But let's say you do all that and then you are in the car and you're feeling stuck. I want you to stop. I mean, you're already stuck. So you're going to turn the song on. That's a good song. And you're going to breathe and you're going to do something where you refocus and use the song to refocus. So I'm going to breathe with the rhythm of the song. It might seem silly, but your brain can't actually do things at two things at once. We can't, we can't have the virtual reality glasses on and do something else. So by refocusing on that simple, silly thing, it, it, it basically gets your brain off that bone and onto another one. Mm. And And you're going to practice that. And when you're not practicing that in the moment, you're going to rehearse it when you're out of the moment. So rehearse, rehearse, waking up in the morning, anxiety coming and you going through these steps that you've decided ahead of time that you're going to go through by doing that. You're priming your brain. It's the same thing when an athlete rehearses something, they're priming their brain so that when, when they come under the fire of performance, their brain goes, oh yeah, you gave me this program, launch that program. So those are a few things that people can start to do 
Yeah, I think that that's so good. Um, the, you know, probably at this stage of the game, when people are watching this, they're gonna they're going, oh yeah, that's true. I can see myself here. You're probably not caught off guard at this point of mm -hmm. your cycle. Mm -hmm. um, being able to map out your cycle is huge, right? Like you're saying, yes. go ahead and take an inventory and yeah. find out when does it typically happen? What's yeah. the subject around? It could yeah. be, uh, it could be when you look in the mirror, uh, guys or ladies, it could be, you know, yeah. when you, when you walk in to the house at night and you see your wife, you know, it could be a whole bunch of different things, but being able to be really super aware of this yeah. is how my life is working yeah. and then what's your plan for that. So it's, yeah. uh, for me being able to write it down, because yeah. like, if you think that you're going to figure this stuff out without putting it on, on pen and paper, you're just not, mm -hmm. you can't be that, you can't be that passive with this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't really work, but yeah. creating that, intentionality and yeah. really mapping it out is massive. Yeah. Well, and if you can talk with someone, write it down and talk with someone, you're doubly reinforcing that. You're doubly reinforcing it. Yeah, that's huge. Can we shift gears just a little bit? Because I feel like we have, we've done a, a, a pretty good job talking about anxiety and what it is and, and how it comes and, and how to handle it, having a pre-made mm -hmm. plan mm -hmm. and doing those, the three R's recognize, uh, refocus or sorry, recognize, relabel, refocus. Mm -hmm. um, the next one to me is, which I'm hearing a lot too, um, is the hopelessness or depression. And I know that it kind of ebbs and flows so much in society with how we're doing as a country. Are we in a war? Um, age of people's kids, that kind of stuff. So there's that side of it. And then there's also like, which we can get into in a little bit, but I just want to kind of talk about it a little bit. The side, um, that is more like medical, you're deficient in something. Um, like for me, part of, part of my initial crash, uh, I was so deficient in vitamin D. I was like mm -hmm. deathly deficient in vitamin D, mm -hmm. which created so many problems in my body. Yep. When I actually took took a test. I was taking 50,000 IUs, yeah. uh, twice a week yeah. for a long time just to get caught up. So, um, there's that whole side of it, but can you talk about depression? How do you diagnose somebody with depression? And then what are some of the like warning signs of it? And then like, how do we ultimately start to get out of depression? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So depression is kind of the other side of the coin with unable to cope or overwhelmed and unable to cope. So one, one thing that your nervous system system can do is go into hyper arousal, which is anxiety, which is overthinking. You can't sleep. You're, you're amped up. But another thing, sometimes your body does the opposite, which is it slows down. You feel lethargic. You feel depressed. You feel hopeless. You feel like you don't have the energy to do important things in your life, even though you want to do them. Like simple things become hard. Um, the things you love to do, you're like, eh, like they don't even, they don't, what used to kind of get you out of a mood can't get you out of a mood. And so think the opposite of anxiety, which is everything kind of slows down. And so that's why you start to feel depressed and hopeless and powerless and heavy. But it's the same thing. It's, it's your system saying, hey, we're overwhelmed. It's overwhelmed. So in the same way, uh, where as with anxiety, you want to kind of help calm your system with depression. You kind of want to help activate your system in a healthy way, right? So some really simple things you can try doing initially is go out in nature, go for a walk, make sure you're exercising, get someone to go walk with you if you have to. Why? Cause I'm helping that body kind of like, um, not deal with, not deal with stress by coping by checking out. So you're helping kind of bring it back to life. And, you know, as far as medicine and all that stuff, for me, it's really about how long have you been dealing with this? Mm. Has this, how long have you been dealing with this? If this is like situational, okay, let's, you know, let's do some therapy. Let's talk this through. Let's, let's see what's happening with your thoughts and behaviors and change, give you some skills. 
But honestly, like sometimes people come to me and I'm like, Oof, like you have been dealing with this for a long time. And by God's grace, and probably the fact that you're gifted and intelligent and you don't give up, you have powered through this. And so it's kind of like the battery on your phone. Like we're using up all of that power. And I don't know how much you have left. So I am not going to mess with that. Like, let's help your body. There's other ways to help your body. And let's, let's use that, that power that's left in your battery to keep, to keep you going. And so maybe at that point, medication could be helpful to just help your brain and nervous system kind of recalibrate because yeah. the reality is everything we do affects our body over time. And so there's no shame in, um, like, like there wouldn't be in anything else if your body needed it. Right. Plus going to the doctor is great. Cause you may discover I have the same issue with vitamin D. I still take, I take 70,000 a week for the rest of my life. My doctor was like, yeah, tapering off for you doesn't work. And I know when I've missed it, cause I look like someone with major depression. Absolutely. And I found this little mat. I call it my magic little vitamin D like who would have thought. So, you know, nutrition is important. Diet is important. Getting out in the sun is important. Um, you can't burn the candle at both ends and expect to thrive. So I, I know, I know your audience. There's, they're really capable people who are probably entrepreneurs and business owners and go after it, but you have your limits and you can't burn the candle at both ends. So knowing what your limits are. But if you do suspect like, ooh, I think like this could be more than just a season or a mood, you don't need to di don't diagnose, don't worry about diagnosing it. Just reach out, reach out, you know, maybe ask your friends who you know will be honest with you. One of my clients, new clients the other day was like, you know, a really good mentor of mine said to me the other day, you don't seem happy. Hmm. And it's been like a long time. And she was like, really? Really? You know, like she was like you, she just powered through. And so talk to you, the people who know you the best. And if they go, yeah, like you've been really powering through this, then just go get some help. And you don't have to have it all figured out. And um, yeah, someone it's so good. Die. Yeah. Recently, I had a meniscus surgery on my, in my knee and, um, they had to sew it back together. So it's like a really painful, long recovery. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I have a newborn. So he's two months oh. old, wow. the cutest little guy ever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and a two year old, mm -hmm. um, and of course work and all that. And so yep. my wife is taking care of the kiddos and here I am like, our baby's not even a month old and I'm getting meniscus surgery. Mm -hmm. And so literally the first seven days of surgery, I didn't get out of bed. Um, like peeing in a bottle type of thing mm -hmm. because it was so excruciating to get out of bed. Yeah. And <clears throat> the man, when you're used to getting out of bed, driving, working out, doing all the stuff that you want to do. And then all of a sudden you can't do any of that. Can't mm -hmm. get your own water. Can't get your own food. Mm -hmm. It's like, I could feel myself like, mm -hmm. Oh, Mm -hmm. buddy, I'm in a free fall. Yeah. And, it, and why I tell the story is because what we first started talking about is that self-awareness, right? I, I yeah. really quickly started to see, mm, okay, this, what I'm feeling right now, I'm feeling low. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to feel depressed. And I yeah. would tell my wife. So that was the key for me is being able to express like, yeah, babe, I'm feeling really low right now. And from there, one thing that was super helpful is what's the story I'm telling myself, right? So asking myself that question, what is the story you're telling yourself? Are you telling yourself, Hey, you just had surgery. You're yeah. healing. You're getting better. Yeah. Like you're on a timeline of getting well, or yeah. am I like, this sucks. My wife's probably frustrated. She's got three kids now to take care of. Yeah. How long am I going to be in this for? What if it doesn't go right? And those two stories have different destinations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, and I think for a lot of guys, the I think stopping and asking yourself, what's the story you're telling yourself? Yeah. Yeah. And what, and then, what would happen? 
Go ahead. And then this will really wake you up out of your story. Ask yourself, what would my life be like without that story? And and that will wake you up. It wakes me up every time. Because then I go, oh, like, well, okay, I, I'd be fine. <laughs> so that it helps it's you true. see like, the power of your thoughts and how quickly they can shift you. And sometimes, man, you've gone so far, it's a whole motion picture. Like, we're beyond the story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but that's okay because the minute you ask yourself that question, phew, you're out of that motion picture. Right? It's true. And the motion picture is so real, guys. So I see a lot of men, their life's been this way, whatever this way. My life's been this way forever. And nobody, yeah. you know, nobody cares for me, thinks about me. And, and part of that can be true, right? Like you've been this yeah. way for a really long time and you yeah. don't have a lot of guys close to you. Okay. Are you going to solve this problem? Right. Or are you the victim that's going to stay here for like, are you continuing to write out? Yeah. This is just how my life is. Right. Yeah. And for me, everything shifts in my life when I go, ah, uh, I'm getting stronger. I'm healing. What can I do? Right. So when I get into what can yeah. I do, I got off. You got options, Shay. Yeah. What can you do? You Even with anxiety, that's helpful. What can I do? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then one of the, one of the studies that I love is the story of the rat with hope. I'm sure that you've heard mm -hmm. the story of the rat with mm -hmm. hope, right? So yeah. I think it's Dr. Kurt Richard, mm -hmm. who, uh, was a scientist back in the, I don't know, sixties or seventies when you're allowed to drown rats, he's putting these rats in a bucket of circulating water and seeing how long they could swim for. Yep. And the average rat swam for like 15 minutes ish, which is a pretty good amount of time. And then Kurt would, he eventually started saving these rats and pulling them out and like resuscitating them, giving them food and water. And then he'd put them back into the tub of circulating water. And the rat swam not for minutes, not even for hours but they swam for days. You guys can look it up yourself. It was like mm -hmm. 60 hours. These rats swam yeah. before drowning. And, um, and he concluded that the rats were powered by hope mm -hmm. somehow, mm -hmm. some way this magical mystical hand was going to come down, grab me and pull me out of here. If I just keep swimming okay. and I'll tell you like, that's the mentality that my dad had growing up. I don't know how, like, that's how you get through this crazy abuse, right? Of being beat up, of, mm -hmm. of being bloody by your stepfather, of being yeah. called stupid ass your whole entire life. And then you grow up having a good life. Like yeah. you have this thing that says somehow, some way good things are going to happen to me. Yeah. And the psych, what happens to you psychologically when you choose to write the narrative, when you grab onto hope, and you say, okay, but what are my options? Okay, but what what can I write? What story do I want to grab onto? It, without even neglecting the bad stuff, right? Because that feels fake. It feels mm -hmm. ungenuine to go like, no, this isn't happening to me, which I think is what a lot of the Christians do in the church is like, no, in Jesus' name, mm -hmm. I don't. It. So you don't have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. But you can look at it from a different perspective, which would be like, hey, God, are, are you seeing this? What's your perspective on that? Can completely shift us out of this depression or at least start to. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's so good. So what you did, um, you didn't do wishful thinking. Some people think hope is wishful thinking. Wishful thinking won't get you anywhere. But if you ask psychologists, the definition of hope, they will say it's the overall perception that a goal, a goal can be met. Yeah. Uh. So he gave these rats hope by showing them that their goal of surviving could be met. You did this for yourself. Number one, you need two things. You need agency, which is belief in yourself, mm. belief that you can do it. And then you need multiple pathways. Mm. So that means the first time I try and it doesn't work, I don't, I, I come up with multiple ways to get to where I want to go. So if That's this didn't, awesome. that didn't work and you did that even by pursuing me, you know, this didn't work, this didn't work. Okay. Well, what the heck? Well, you know, I'm just going to keep pursuing these pathways until I get achieve my goal. So someone with high hope has both of those. They have a high level of agency, which is belief in themselves and they have multiple pathways. The good news is if you don't believe in yourself, 
we can, we can help you with that. So you can increase your hope. Or you believe in yourself, but every time it doesn't work, you give up. Oh, you just need some help with pathways. You just need someone to sit down with you or you need to sit down and come up with, okay, we can come up with multiple ways to get to where we want to go. Yeah, it's so good. Um, the ability for a human to be creative, to have perseverance, yeah. to have grit, right? Like Angela would say, um, to know that my job is to continue to, to uh, invent. My job is, is to continue to pursue, be creative, to find out other solutions mm -hmm. and to not give up. Um, it's God's job to ultimately guide me down the right path. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, yeah. and to be the one that's in charge of my life. And I think, you know, if you've been stuck in a place of hopelessness where you're looking at your life and you're just going, man, I don't know that there's a really great way you need a different perspective. And yeah. so to me, this is the last, the last little, um, tip or tool is sometimes hearing another person's story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hearing someone else's testimony. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. cause we would say like a testimony is, is like the spirit of prophecy. So yeah. if God did it one time, he'll do it again. And that's what I love about even doing these podcasts and, and reading good books is you see it happen in somebody and you go, well, I'm a somebody, mm -hmm. why not me? Yeah. And so that's the other thing that's cool about reaching out to somebody, to a, another man in your life or, you know, a therapist is I have thousands of testimonies in my in my experience that I can go, Oh yeah. Yeah. I've seen lots of couples who've had affairs get well. Oh, I've seen lots of guys that were stuck in porn get completely well. Oh, yeah. I know a story that's way worse than yours. And the guy was way less capable and he, yeah, he didn't, he just did the work and he's fine. And, mm -hmm. and you're, you have tons of them too. So sometimes like what people don't know they're paying for is they're paying for our experience and seeing people get well, the testimony. And it, it's so incredibly powerful. So men, like, do you have, are you locked and loaded with these testimonies about the journey that you're on, the mountain that you're facing and just knowing, oh, tons of people climb this hill every year. Okay. I can do it. Complete game changer. Mm -hmm. Like that sometimes can be the first step is like, no, just go find somebody who's done it before, who's mm -hmm. gotten out of depression or who's beat anxiety or somebody who's been on the path before to give you a little bit of hope. You want to say anything about that, Margaret? Uh, yeah, of course. I have a goofy name for it. Uh, you know, I call it being a hope holder. And so I tell my clients sometimes when they come to me, like, you know what? Let me, I know you have no hope. Let me have the hope for both, for, for, for you. And I can do that until your hope, you know, it's kind of like Moses when they're holding up Moses' arms in the desert. Mm -hmm. And so we all need, who's your hope holder? Who's the person who will hold hope and faith for you when you can't. That's the beautiful thing about the Christian life. Like God doesn't say you have to have faith all the time and hope all the time. Like find someone who mm -hmm. can carry that for you until you regain, you regain it. Cause that's just as powerful. And uh, so we can't, none of us can do this alone, right? We all need, we just need other people around us. And then it's so fun to do that for other people. And you will, you'll be able to do that for other people. Comfort them. It's so true. You perceive yourself. Yeah, it's so true. Um, gosh, I could talk about this all day, mm -hmm. but I know that that uh, we got to go. Um, this is super helpful because it gives guys a place to really start to build from. And mm -hmm. you can continue, guys, you can continue to, to troubleshoot. Like maybe you need more pathways if you're dealing with hopelessness. Maybe you need... Uh, to understand your triggers a little bit better. So you don't get so caught off guard. Maybe you need a better plan for your refocus, but by at least having a really good strategy, right. Mm -hmm. For how to regulate your emotions, how to regulate those triggers that, that are, or how to deal with the triggers that are coming. You yeah. can be super powerful over your life. And so, um, we just want to give you that today, Margaret, thank you so much yeah. for coming on. 
and for blessing us today. Guys, mm-hmm. if you are um, wanting to follow a little bit more of what Margaret's doing, get some more of her insight. Uh, she does a lot on social media and is also available, I think, for um, appointments and, and, and help. So, mm-hmm. um, Margaret, we'll put the we'll put the link to your social media. Um, Sounds good. Yeah. In there. And I guess if they want to get a hold of you for appointments, they can just private message you on Facebook yeah. is, or, yeah. or Instagram. Um, Instagram. Yeah. Instagram. Okay. Awesome. Margaret, well, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah. Thank you. You're so awesome. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Yeah. Me too. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening to the Brave Co podcast. If you like this podcast, would you please rate it, review it, leave us a great comment. And if you like this episode in particular, share it with your friends and family. That helps us to spread the word. Guys, stay brave. We'll see you next week.